Hey there folks, welcome to another edition of Boobless Craft Builds. Today I'm going to be walking you through how to build a coffee bar nook cabinet like this with a oak natural edge slab top. It's about a medium complexity build I would say for the most part. The cabinet body itself is pretty simple. If you've seen any of my other videos or anybody else's on building those, cabinets are pretty easy. Uh, the, the natural edge slabs where things get a little tougher but it's really just it's, it's more unique thing and you got to have some unique tools like a router sled, which I had to build for this. I'll probably do, create another video on how I built that router sled myself, but there's others out there on YouTube if you want to watch one of theirs. We've got two cabinets built in and a drawer over on this side for all of our, our bar tools and a built-in wine fridge over here. But hope you enjoy and stay tuned for the build. For the first part of the build, I was going to make the body of the cabinets, and to start that, I needed to cut down the 3 quarter inch birch plywood I had purchased to more manageable pieces using my circular saw. I measured out and marked the cuts with the 4 foot level as a straight edge, and then ripped the plywood into 3 pieces. With the sheet plywood cut down to sections, I was able to switch over to my table saw and then cut the side pieces for the first half of the cabinets to the exact dimensions. Using the circular saw and table saw, I repeated the steps to cut all of the remaining back, bottom, and side pieces to build both cabinet boxes. With all of the cabinet body pieces cut, I moved on to drilling pocket holes in the necessary pieces to join the cabinet body together. I drilled pocket holes along what was going to be the front edge of each piece, where I would later join the oak fascia. For the bottom piece, I drilled on both side edges as well to connect to the side panels of the cabinet. For the side panels, I also drilled along the top edge to later mount my slab cabinet top. And for the back panel, I drilled along all four edges to join it to the bottom, sides, and top. When drilling pocket holes, you want to think about what faces or parts of the cabinet will be most visible and do your best to avoid drilling where it will be easily seen. Next, it was time to assemble the body of the cabinets. With all of my pocket holes pre-drilled, it became an easy process of joining each piece together. For the coffee half, it was purely the two sides, the bottom, the back, and a top support piece. For the bar half, I also added in a vertical divider in the middle of the cabinet to separate what would be my liquor cabinet from the wine fridge portion. Instead of your traditional kitchen or vanity cabinet with a kick plate on the bottom, I chose to use 4 inch feet to raise the nook cabinets off the floor. You could build your own feet, but since I did not have a lathe at the time, I went with these that I had found at the local big back store for really cheap. For the bar half of the cabinet body, I also decided to cut out a portion of the back to allow more airflow around the wine fridge. There are wine fridges out there made to be tightly enclosed inside a cabinet. However, they can triple the cost. For the one I bought, as long as it had a few inches of air gap on all sides, it would operate fine. And by cutting out a hole in the back, I was ensuring that the air gap would stay closer to the, in temperature to the entire room. Next, I began working on the oak fascia for the fronts of the cabinets. For ease, I typically stick to standard 1x2s of oak that you can buy at any big box store for fascia. It can be more cost effective to buy in bulk from a hardware dealer, however, when it comes to the fascia, I feel that having quick and easy, consistent stock that I do not have to rip or plane down to size myself outweighs the extra cost I have to spend. There are only three parts of the fascia that needed to be wider than 1x2. One piece on either side of the wine fridge to hide the air gap that I would be leaving inside the cabinet, and a third piece where the two halves of the cabinet would meet. This wider piece is needed to ensure that both cabinet doors can open and won't be impeded by each other. In hindsight, I could have ripped two additional wider pieces for this joint area, one for each half of the cabinet to offset both sides instead of just one. Doing that would have allowed for a second drawer to be built on the coffee side. However, at the time, I was only thinking about the one drawer, so I did not offset both sides. But more on that later. Just like with the body of the cabinet, I typically use pocket hole screws to join the fascia pieces together. This works great because it is fast, easy, and you can hide all of the pocket holes on the back side of the fascia that will typically never be seen. One tip I have when building fascia for corner cabinets that would be joined together like this one 
is to build, assemble, and mount one half of the fascia and then align your two cabinets how they will be joined together before you cut all of the pieces for the second half of the cabinet. This is done so that you can get an accurate measurement from where the front half cabinet that you have assembled with fascia meets exactly on the front half of the cabinet without the fascia. You can then use that measurement to determine how wide your horizontal fascia pieces need to be cut for the second half of the cabinet to ensure a perfect fit. With the cabinet bodies ready, I switched over to building my single drawer on the liquor side of the cabinet. I used offcuts of the same birch plywood I had used for the bodies. You don't need to use 3 quarter inch plywood for drawers like this, and can easily use thinner stock for a lighter drawer overall. But since I already had the wood, I just stuck with it. I tend not to make my drawers overly fancy with any rabbit statos or box joints, and just stick with pocket holes and glue. Again, if you think about where you place the holes, drilling only into the front, back, and bottom piece, they will be concealed in locations that most people will never see. For mounting drawer slides, I like to use these Craig drawer slides jigs. They're easy to use and always give consistent results. I always start by mounting the slides into the cabinet and then I set the drawer on top of the jig with the slides partially extended to mount the slides to the drawer. One thing to keep in mind is that when you have a fascia board that overhangs on the inside of your cabinet, you will need to mount a piece inside of the cabinet to make the slides flush if you are going to use side mounted drawer slides. This is another time where using the consistent 1x2 stock from the big box store comes in handy. By doing so, all of my fascia overhangs were exactly 3 quarters of an inch thick, allowing me to use more plywood offcuts for the space blocks. I made a shelf for each cabinet out of 3 quarter inch birch plywood. Because the front edge of the plywood is very visible, I used some iron on birch edge banding to conceal the plywood layers from being seen. For mounting the shelves, I cut 4 14 inch temporary support pieces to hold the shelf level inside of the cabinet while I was screwing it into place. You could do adjustable shelving with dowel pins, but since I built these cabinets with a specific purpose in mind, I was comfortable permanently mounting the shelves. It was finally time to start sanding the cabinets. I lightly sanded, working my way up to 220 grit before I applied stain and varnish to the entire cabinet body. I really wanted the slab tops of the cabinet to be the focus of the entire piece, which is why I decided to do a dark walnut stain on the cabinet to contrast the grain, color, and pattern of my slabs. Typically for a piece this size I would hook up the air compressor and spray gun and just spray the entire thing with stain. But we were having quite a long spell of back-to-back -back days of rain and I did not want to risk spraying outdoors and then having to drag in a half-dried piece when it started raining. Welcome back. This is why we can't be outside right now spraying on this farm. So we're going to have to get old school and fly by hand. Now a lesser known fact of how to really upgrade your, your final finish is after you put several coats of varnish on, you're going to want wet sand with a very high grit, so I'm using 2000 grit sandpaper, and just very lightly wet sand it. What this does is any dust or fine particles that got in and bubbling that makes it just a, the slightest bit rough. This will take those down, won't sand the wood any, won't remove the varnish, it'll just knock off those really hot, those minute high spots to make a really smooth finish. After wet sanding, the bodies of my barnook cabinets were both finished and I decided to move on to the slab tops. For those of you like me that do not have access to an industrial size planer, the route you'll have to take with leveling slabs is to use a router sled. They're fairly easy to build and I built mine specifically for this job. Feel free to let me know in the comments if you'd like to see how I built mine, but there are several other designs out there on the YouTube Maker community that I would recommend. If you're sticking with an all wood design, I would recommend the Evening Woodworkers video. Now I won't belabor the point much here, but if you're thinking about leveling slabs like this, I say go for it if you feel comfortable, but do not underestimate the length of time that it will take. You need to go slow with all of your passes, only taking off a little bit of material each. And when you're dealing with a five foot long slab that is 20 inches wide, it takes a long time. Between my two slabs, the thickest point at the start was just about two and three quarter inches thick. 
When I was finished with the slab tops, everything was down to a uniform thickness of about an inch and three eighths. Now that's a lot of material removed. It was a rewarding build and I love the way the slabs look, but when I was done, I didn't want to look at another slab for several months. Now, things didn't work out that way, and just a few weeks later I was already picking out my next piece for my next project. But what can I say? I'm a glutton for punishment, and I knew people would just enjoy these builds. Once the slabs were flat, I went about cleaning up the edges. First, I removed the bulk of the remaining bark using just a hammer and chisel. If you don't remove the bark, you run the risk of it separating from the wood later on. And I don't know about you, but I don't think it's worth the risk after all the work I put into this piece. Then, with the bark removed, I went back over the large areas of the edge with my grinder using a sanding disc. You will see a lot of power carvers out there in the maker community recommending the Cutsaw shaping discs, and I'm sure they work great. But I was already over budget on the tools I bought for this single project, and since I just wanted to keep the natural shape of the edge as much as I could, I did not think it was worth it. After the major sanding with the grinder, I switched to the fine details using my Dremel to get into all the hard reach places. With the edges cleaned up, it was time to get to my two slab pieces lined up. This meant cutting a 45 degree for the corner where the two pieces meet. As I said before, I do not have access to an industrial shop, so I used a level to act as a straight edge guide for my circular saw. Now measuring an exact 45 when the reference edges of your workpiece are natural, and therefore anything but straight, can be tricky. My trick was to lay a separate straight piece that was lo as long as the board along the edge of the slab when marking the 45. Doing this meant that all the little bumps and curves along the natural edge would not throw off my cut. After cutting my slab tops, I moved on to filling all the cracks and voids in the surface with epoxy. I really liked the color and grain pattern of these two pieces of oak, so I decided to use a pure black epoxy so that it would stand out, but not detract from the beauty of the wood. A quick tip I learned from Blacktail Studio is to use charcoal powder when dyeing your epoxy black. It's cheaper than most dyes out there, and it will not absorb into the wood. But don't be extra cheap and try to use your own crushed charcoal. Just buy the powder online. I threw the slabs back on the router sled to remove the excess epoxy, and once everything was back to flat, I finished the slab top with varnish. Now since this top is going to be where coffee, liquor, and our wine is kept, I wanted to make sure the top was extra protected against any spills. I did not want to be two weeks into using this cabinet and have a nice dark red stain from a spilled Zinfandel on the top. As such, I chose a satin polyacrylic to build up a protective layer while also not changing the look of the wood too much. So if you thought we were done after I finished the slab tops, you forgot that when I left things off in the video I had yet to build this drawer or this cabinet door. Unfortunately, I lost that video footage. Apologies on my end, but I didn't want you guys to lose this whole build just because I lost a little bit of the footage. It was a rather simple drawer. I just used scrap pieces of plywood from the bodies of the cabinet, pocket hole screwed it together, and then mounted on an oak front piece in the drawer front. I did a Roman OG on my router table all around the edges for that drawer front. For the cabinet doors, again, stuck with that Roman OG, did oak for the sides, and then did a shaker style panel by recessing in a piece of quarter inch birch plywood for both of those door fronts and that birch matches the sides again of the body of the cabinet. Mounted on some railroad spike hardware for it just to give it a little bit more of that rustic look and feel. But that really was it. I assembled the cabinet inside the house actually because of the size and weight, especially these slabs. Put the two halves of the cabinet together and then mounted the slabs on top of them as to the last bit. And that was really all she wrote for this build. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give us a comment, a like, or subscribe to the channel. We really appreciate that. And I hope you stay tuned for all our future Bublitz Craft builds. Thank you.